later today, President Joe Biden is expected to sign an executive order aimed at what the administration is calling a promotion of competition within the American economy. The order is set to cover a number of areas. And joining us now to talk through some of the key initiatives within this plan is Bharat Ramamurti. He's a deputy director for the National Economic Council. Bharat, great to speak with you uh, once again. I want to start with an area that, that jumped out to me within this and has certainly gotten a lot of play in the business press, which is um, the, the executive order around non-compete clauses and around the um, licensing requirements for some industries. I'm wondering if you could just sketch out um, how the administration thinks about some of these issues and, and what exactly uh, is, in, is in the order. Sure. So uh, one out of uh, every three private companies uh, has non-compete agreements for its workers, which means that that limits the ability of workers to go switch to a better job for them. It has the effect of reducing wages uh, and reducing competition uh, for workers. Uh, what And in fact, one out of every five uh, workers without a college degree is subject to a non-compete agreement, right? These are folks working in retail, working uh, construction and so on. We're not talking about uh, high-level executives. And so what the president is calling on the FTC to do is to uh, examine non-compete agreements and take steps to ban or at least curtail the use of those agreements so that those millions of workers are going to have more ability to go switch to a job that's better for them. Uh, same thing on occupational licensing. Look, some licensing is important for protecting public safety, uh, for, for making sure that people are qualified to do certain jobs. But a lot of the occupational licensing rules that we have uh, simply restrict mobility. And in fact, they restrict people uh, literal mobility, right? They make it harder for somebody who lives in Florida under one licensing regime to move to Georgia and keep uh, being a beautician or working at a nail salon where there's some licensing requirements. It's particularly burdensome on military spouses uh, Thirty-four percent of whom work in an industry where there is a license requirement, and they have to move every few years uh, because their uh, spouse is in the military. So, what we are asking the FTC to do is to look again at the factual record, determine whether some of these occupational licensing restrictions uh, can be eliminated, so that workers have a better chance to move, have a better chance to find the job that's best for them. You know, in the president's view, we are in the middle of a historic economic recovery, one that is seeing higher wages for workers and these changes to improve worker mobility uh, are, are intended to complement that. Hey, Brad, it's Julie here. I wanna go back to non-compete for um, just a moment. And I know that that really affects probably the tech industry more than anything else, although some other professional services industries as well. Um, I believe there is also some legislation out there that addresses this issue. So I wonder how this uh, order is, is being viewed within the administration as being complementary to that instead of that as a tool to maybe help nudge that through? How are you guys looking at it? Well, just one quick correction. You're right. It's it's prevalent in the tech industry, but it also affects, like I said, construction, hospitality, retail. 60 million workers are subject to this. For a long time, it was fast food workers. You worked at a sandwich shop. You couldn't go work at the sandwich shop across the street because you were subject to a non-compete agreement yoga teachers, summer camp counselors are subject to these agreements. So look, this is not just about high level executives with uh, deep institutional knowledge. That's very valuable. Uh, that's point number one. Number two, uh, as you note, there are uh, solid bipartisan efforts uh, in Congress to uh, eliminate or restrict non-compete agreements. Um, we, are, uh, we would encourage Congress to move forward with that legislation. Of course, legislation can accomplish this uh, uh, more directly. Uh, and, and potentially more, more quickly than working through the rulemaking process. So uh, we don't view this as uh, instead of legislative effort, uh, we encourage Congress to move forward on that legislative effort. If a bill to ban non-compete agreements comes to the president's desk, he'd be happy to sign it. Digging deeper into this uh, executive order, Barat, uh, I'm seeing that it, it says that hospital mergers can, can be harmful to patients uh, and you're encouraging the Justice Department and the FTC to review and revise merger guidelines for hospitals. Now, hospital CEOs will say they have had to merge through the years uh, because margins are, are, are slim here and they have to gain economies of scale. And if they can't merge, they, they might have to close hospitals down. What's your message to them? Well, look, the data shows that there has been uh, uh, quite a bit of consolidation in the hospital industry. Uh, that's been particularly harmful for, for rural communities because what happens is that hospitals consolidate and they shut down uh, the hospitals that operate in rural communities. What we've seen is that after hospital mergers, prices go up for, uh, for patients by as much as 20%. And by the way, on the wage side too, uh, uh, research has shown that after ho hospital consolidation, 
wages for nurses and administrative staff, uh, the wage growth declines. And so uh, we think that there are real harms to consolidation in the hospital sector. What we are asking the DOJ and the FTC to do is really scrutinize these mergers and make sure that at the end of the day, what's going to happen is a better outcome for patients, a better outcome for people who work at, at hospitals. Uh, you know, we are not prejudging any particular merger, right? It's going to be up to the DOJ and the FTC and the expertise that they have at those agencies. What we are trying to do is point out that this idea that consolidation leads to more efficiency, it's just not borne out in many cases by the evidence. And, and Barad, we keep alluding to how sort of sweeping this bill is, how many different, uh, or EO, excuse me, this is, how many different industries it affects. Um, from an economic big picture perspective, what is the administration hoping this will achieve? Sure, I think it's very simple. Lower prices for consumers, higher wages for workers, and I, I want to make sure we hit this point, uh, a more dynamic and innovative economy. You know, we have seen uh, a host of research come out over the last several years about how uh, when industries are more concentrated, there is less investment, there is less investment in R&D specifically, fewer patents are generated. In other words, as industries get more concentrated, there's less competitive pressure on them to be innovative, to come up with that next great idea to secure customers because they have a stranglehold on the customers, right? So what we are trying to do is by, promote more, by promoting more competition in these industries, not only reduce prices for consumers, but put pressure again on companies to really invest in innovation, invest in uh, training their workers all so that they can uh, try and produce better products, better services, and, and, and attract uh, customers in a truly competitive environment. And, you know, Brad, finally, before we let you go, we are um, certainly still in the midst of the pandemic, but we see the economy rebounding as we start to exit some of the most acute impacts from it. And as um, you, know, you guys on the Economic Council think about where this order fits into uh, the future of the U.S. economy, how much is, is it in response to maybe what our shortcomings were as this pandemic broke out, you know, compared to other initiatives that, you know, yourself or other members of the council have for a long time looked at as things we needed to do in the U.S. economy, regardless of whether we had a recession, pandemic, otherwise? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, look, I think this is about responding both to a long-term trend uh, towards increasing concentration across a number of industries um, and uh, short-term issues that arose during the pandemic, right? So, for example, there's been incredible consolidation in the uh, meatpacking industry. Uh, and when we saw that one of the major meatpackers was uh, affected by a cyber attack, um, that led to an enormous uh, increase in prices that, that folks were being charged. Um, and if we had a more diverse, more competitive industry, uh, some of those effects would have been mitigated, right? And so uh, uh, increasing competition is not just about in the long term, more growth and lower prices. It's also making sure that we have a diverse uh, set of companies that are available to step in in case something happens to one of them, uh, which is critical uh, not only for consumers, but in many cases for national security. All right, we'll leave it there. Brat Ramamurti, uh, Deputy Director of the National Economic Council. Uh, Brat, thanks so much for spending some time with us this morning. I hope we'll be in touch. Rebuilding closets for life after the pandemic powered Levi's to some impressive top and bottom line gains in the second quarter. The company smashed analyst earnings estimates by 14 cents and issued second half guidance that was well above consensus. Shares are up about, about 3 percent uh, so far on today's session. Joining us now is Levi's CFO, Harmeet Singh. Harmeet, always good to see you. I'll start with this. You know, my Twitter feed is on fire right now. I put out this stat you all shared on your uh, earnings call last night. 35% of consumers in the U.S. have changed their waist sizes uh, because of the pandemic. What does that mean to your business? Good morning, uh, Brian and everybody on the team. Uh, it's great to be here. We had a wonderful quarter. As you know, we beat... Uh, top line and bottom line expectation and raise the outlook uh, for the second half of the year. To your question about uh, the increase of, or the change in sizes, uh, the, uh, what it means is that people are out there shopping. Um, the category apparel as a category um, has expanded. Denim is, it has uh, grown or is growing faster than the category. And for market leaders like us, as we set trends, you know, we set the trend on the loser silhouette, uh, the wider silhouette uh, just before the pandemic. And our loser baggier fits now account for about half our business and growing. Um, and as people return to work, 
casualization trends, uh, you know, tend to gather pace, it really bodes well for brands like us uh, as people trust our brands and importantly, uh, return to work with more denim in their closet. Army, I went to the mall by me over the weekend, and really, so much, so many things are out of stock. I pulled up, a, I picked up a pair of Levi's jeans. I looked at the price on the tag, and my thought was, "Wow, these are pretty affordable. Uh, Levi should be charging more for these because jeans are so much in demand." Have you been able to push through price increases, and are you going to implement more in the back half of this year? You know, uh, our products give great value to our consumers, um, and. Um, you know, we're very pleased with the momentum we are seeing and have seen over the years. To your question about pricing, we have successfully uh, taken pricing even during the pandemic and continue to do so. You know, I firmly believe uh, we, have firm, we have pricing power. It's always better to price when the brand's hot, the products are relevant, than when you need to price. And we continue to do that. Our AURs, um, you know, in the quarter, we're up 5% globally. And our view is we are in the early innings of pricing. Um, and as we introduce more innovation and relevant products, take our loser bag of fits, they are high AURs, they price a little uh, higher and resonating really well with the consumer. So it's clearly an opportunity for us. We are also using AI and data analytics, uh, analytics to manage promotion, to determine where we can price and where we can't. And that's making a big difference. You know, Harmeet, we're talking about um, taking pricing here in, in the U.S. perhaps as we, as we see, you know, some, some bit of an inflationary backdrop. But um, you guys talked a little bit about what you're seeing um, in Europe and where, you know, you are, as you guys mentioned, a market leader in, in that market. It's been a little bit more challenging with uh, the pandemic and their economy. I'm, I'm curious how you could, uh, if you could outline for us the trends you're seeing in Europe and, and maybe how far behind you see that recovery relative to what you've seen in the U.S. business. You know, our brand has been on fire in Europe uh, uh, pre-pandemic, um, and uh, the team has done a phenomenal job being agile and uh, responding to the changing situation. Uh, I'm empathetic uh, to the folks uh, and consumers on the ground, as all of them have been through lockdowns. But the good news is the lockdowns are lifting, and as we exited May, you know, our, our business in Europe was actually all, already showing a high single digit growth relative to 19. Um, during the pandemic, you know, we made a real pivot to um, e-commerce and digital. Our digital business is up and growing big time, you know, has doubled uh, over the years. And as the lockdowns lift, uh, you know, most of our doors now in Europe are open. During the quarter, about 30% of our doors were closed. And so business was 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 down relative uh, to uh, you know 19. Business is recovering and growing relative to 19. So I'm very um, uh, a long in Europe. We have a, a huge potential, and importantly, you know we've been able to take pricing as well as our products are resonating with our consumers. Hi, Harmeet, it's Julie here. You mentioned the increase in the direct sales channel, which I believe was up 75% year over year for you guys. Does that have, I imagine the margins are better when you sell that way. Does it also help you in terms of inventory management when you have that sort of direct channel to the customers and perhaps better insight and data on them? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, structurally, we're emerging from the pandemic, a much stronger company. And let me explain that. Uh, digital is a higher mix. So if you take the total digital ecosystem, it's about a fourth of our business. It was in the mid-teens pre-pandemic and growing. I mean, our entire digital ecosystem was up 75%. Um, and that was on the back of a strong uh, you know, quarter a year ago. It has higher gross margins. We had our third consecutive quarter of record uh, high, you know, gross margins. Um, and we raised our guidance uh, for the year. More importantly, what it does is it allows us to connect directly uh, with our consumers. And we're connecting directly. We're, we're reaching out to the younger consumer. We introduced the app, uh, an, an app in the US, and 70% uh, of the users on the app are younger consumers. And so it allows us to engage with them directly, allows, them to, allows us to offer our latest collaborations and our assortments, which are head to toe, uh, you know, directly. And I think it may, it's, it's uh, definitely making a big difference. 
um, and allowing us to exemplify and endure our brand. Armin, are you having difficulty finding workers to work in your retail stores? You know, the, um, the good news for us is that, uh, you know, at our attrition rates are low, uh, lower than the others. We are responding by ensuring that the total rewards that we offer to our employees are competitive in the marketplace. Um, you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, normal uh, pressures, but we have been able to um, withstand them and ensure our employees uh, are servicing our consumers uh, with the same service levels that we maintained uh, pre-pandemic. So the quick answer is we probably will see some wage inflation, but uh, we're able to um, withstand that just given the, the brand we are and the service levels we provide and the benefits we provide to our employees. All right, I'll leave it there. Harmeet Singh, uh, CFO of Levi's, good to see you. And good to see you back in the jean jacket. Last time I think we caught you in more casual look, but, but good to see you back in your trademark uh, piece of apparel. Uh, thank you, Brian, and uh, thanks for having me on your show. Thanks so much. All right, welcome back to Young Finance Live on this Friday morning. Well, the hot SPAC market continues to roll on. Earlier this week, Planet Labs announcing that it will go public in a SPAC transaction with DMY Technology Group 4. It'll value Planet Labs about $2.8 billion. And Planet CEO and co-founder Will Marshall joins us now uh, to discuss the deal. Will, let's just start with um, kind of the, the proposition uh, that, that you guys have, because I think we're all quite interested in just what the product is and, and who the end user is. So um, you say uh, in the release here, the, the data set you have is a scan of Earth, of the whole Earth. That's the whole thing. Um, tell us a little bit about the process of gathering this and, and who your customers are. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, so Planet is a data company. We have a fleet of 200 satellites that image the entire Earth's landmass once per day. It's a lion scanner for the Earth. And that imagery powers decisions for companies. So uh, as they see change across the planet, let me give you a few examples. In agriculture, we scan all the agricultural farms around the world every day, and farmers use it to improve their crop yield by determining where's, where it needs fertilizer, where it, 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 needs, it needs to be harvested. Precision agriculture improves agriculture yields by 20 or 40%. Uh, data is used to update maps that you see online. So Google Maps, for example, use our data and self-healing maps to keep them up to date. Um, and uh, governments use it for things like disaster response. So after floods and fires and earthquakes, our data is used to help the responders. So it's real-time information that helps people make smarter decisions. I think one way to think about it is a bit like a Bloomberg terminal, but for Earth data. You know, Bloomberg terminal serves up financial data, uh, and then people make smart decisions on it. Uh, we serve up Earth data into a wide variety of vertical markets like ag, mapping, finance, forestry, et cetera. And then people, it embeds into their workflows and they make smart decisions. And just like a Bloomberg terminal, it's high growth, high margins, and, and it's, it's really sticky. So our customers really like using it, and uh, it's a brand new and unique data set. Well, about 69% of your business uh, comes from agriculture, civil, and defense. Who is not using this product that you're going after? Well, a lot of people uh, are, uh, uh, could use it that aren't using it yet. Uh, for example, in insurance, people could use it to check uh, insurance claims without having to send people out, especially in where we're getting moving to less remote and more remote uh, first culture. Uh, finance companies could use it to better markets. We can tell the crop uh, output from all the world's soy fields every day or the ships into and out of the all the world's top ports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, right now, Planet is working on software that enables those kinds of users. So right now, we're going to the big ag companies, mapping companies, uh, governments that can get value out of our data today. And this uh, money that we're getting through going public is going to enable us to invest in software to make it usable to more people, not just the big countries and big companies. Um, Will, it's Julie here. Um, operating satellites, one would imagine, is expensive. Uh, maintaining them, expensive. Crunching all of this data and making sense of it, expensive. So, so talk to me about cost of business and your margins and profitability track. Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, this is, it, it is, it, we do put satellites up. We do have to buy rockets and, and so on. But you'll be surprised to learn that the capital expenses are less than 10% of our um, overall budget this year. Um, we have miniaturized the satellites, made them much more efficient, 
Uh, we, therefore, that brings down the launch costs. We have super efficient uh, uh, partnerships on cloud compute to bring those costs down. And so actually, the capital expenditures are really low. And what's also important for profitability is that we sell our data feeds on this Bloomberg-like time of Earth data. We sell those data feeds to multiple users. Selling a data feed to more the second users, of course, the incremental cost is very, very low. So our margins are actually very high. Last year on our PlanetScope business, which is a daily scan, 73% of our revenue comes from that uh, satellite fleet. Uh, the uh, profit margins were 66%, including depreciation and amortization of all the satellites. So fully loaded. Uh, and so it really looks like a software business at this point, a data business. And that's based on a revolution that's happening on the satellite side that has massively reduced the cost that we have pioneered called agile aerospace. And so, yes, high margins, high growth. All right, Will Marshall, uh, CEO, co-founder at Planet Labs. Will, appreciate the time this morning. Uh, really interesting company, and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch as you guys continue your journey towards the public markets. Well, it has been a brutal week for Chinese tech stocks listed in the U.S., and we are seeing some of those back in the green today. Didi has seen the steepest losses on the week just one week after it debuted in the U.S. here, and you see green across the board with Didi up about uh, 3%, followed by Tencent Music, Baidu, Alibaba, and Pinduoduo. Uh, Crane shares, ETF, KWeb also getting hit hard on the back of that. But let's take a look at where it's trading today. Crane Funds Advisors, of course, a global asset management firm known for its China-focused ETFs. And as a result, we are seeing it up about 4% in the session. Let's bring in Brendan Ahern, Crane Chairs ETF's Chief Investment Officer. Brendan, I see you sort of just breathing a sigh of relief on this Friday. It has been a rocky week. A number of headlines, bottom line, Chinese regulators trying to crack down on Didi and its listing in the U.S. concerns about data privacy, as well as what information can be handed over. And then there's the larger question here about where Chinese regulators are trying to go to in terms of allowing Chinese companies to list in the U.S. How are you connecting the dots right now? Try to make sense of all of it for me. Well, I, I think we do have to separate Didi from the broader China regulation of the internet space. That that Didi pushed, uh, got its IPO up uh, potentially without receiving an implicit approval from the onshore regulators. That regulator is going to be concerned about uh, Didi's what technology providers is it using. How is it protecting user data? Uh, so I think Didi's situation is a little bit separate from, from a broader regulation of uh, Hong Kong US lit listed internet stocks that we hold within K-Web that are very, very critical parts of China's economy. And China's regulators is simply saying, you're so important, you're going to have to be regulated. You need some supervision. And I, th I think investors have kind of connecting the two and driven down these stocks uh, to, to very low levels, which uh, despite very, very strong fundamentals. So let's separate out Didi for a second here, because um, you've got now lawmakers over in D.C. calling for an SEC investigation into whether, in fact, Didi misled investors. And I know you highlighted the fact that there were multiple pages in that S-1 filing that did highlight the overarching risk that could come with regulation. Has your fundamental investment thesis on Didi changed as a result of what we learned this week? Yeah, Kiko, Didi's IPO prospectus had 60 pages of risk factors, including China regulation. So, so I think the call for regulatory action, um, it, it's, it's difficult because institutional investors who participated in the IPO, they were given those risk factors in advance. Uh, the SEC is apt to say, well, you're an institutional investor. You should know their risks are. And just because the IPO didn't pan out like you like, like you would have liked, that's that's harder. You know, if, what if it had gone up? Would you still be calling for this? So um, I think I think the IPO regulatory situation is a little bit different uh, because of the level of risk factors involved. Um, at the same time, obviously, the timing is, is very, very poor coming uh, 48 hours after the IPO. Uh, this company is audited by price uh, price. 
uh, Waterhouse Coopers Chinese affiliate. Uh, so there's there's no question about the quality of the company's audit. It's it's the same of auditors who do the China operations of U.S. listed companies. So this has nothing to do with an audit issue. It's just a very poor from a timing perspective. But but is is that investment thesis still intact? I mean, I know we talked the day that Didi listed. You talked about the growth opportunities in China, which is certainly important given that about ninety percent of their revenue comes from the Chinese market. Has any of that changed? And for investors, how should they be looking at what that risk premium should look like now that we know what's come out of China and what regulators are looking at? So so Didi's not being allowed to bring on new users. At the same time, this is a company with nearly half a billion current annual users who are still using Didi. That, that Didi is still doing 40 million, uh, 41 million rides a day uh, in China. That, that hasn't changed. And I think as much as, yes, the, the stocks come down, when we get the company's Q2 earnings, they might be really, really strong. You know, time will tell. We can't predict the future. So I don't think the underlying fundamentals of the company have been affected by the regulation. That's very true, which, which what we've seen from the broader China internet space. When you look at the Q1 2021 earnings from Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong and the U.S., the earnings were really, really strong. The companies are adhering, adapting to the regulation, and we've we've not seen them negatively impacted by the regulation. The, the only caveat, Akiko, would be uh, the online education companies. Uh, the two big online education companies, they're apt to see the number of hours that kids can use their online tutoring services. Those are probably going to be curtailed. But those stocks are down 70% year to date. But, but for the broader China internet space, we've not seen the regulatory situation impact the balance sheet nor the income statements of these companies. Let's talk about the broader scrutiny on foreign listed Chinese companies. And you could argue that the U.S. listed ones are getting the most scrutiny. Chinese regulators have made it pretty clear this week that they're going to try to close some loopholes, especially for these so-called VIEs that have shell companies outside of China in order to list these companies in places like the U.S. What does that suggest in terms of the flow into the U.S. Are we going to see Chinese companies now continue to pull back from the U.S.? Are we going to see these dual markets sort of uh, separate? I mean, how should we be looking at what exactly the regulators are trying to get at? Is it about punishing U.S. investors or is it about sort of tightening the screws on their control over these companies? I think it, I think it is around the data issue, which you pointed out, Akiko. That that in the case of Didi, the regulator doesn't know who who its technology providers are. Are they local Chinese companies? Are they foreign companies? What is the company doing to protect user data in China? And so, in the case of Ant Group, which was also potentially facing regulation about it, called itself a fintech company and was avoiding being regulated a, like a bank. Because that listing was going to be in Hong Kong, the regulator could say, whoa, 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 hold on. You're, you're going to list knowing you're about to be regulated. In the case of Didi, by listing in the United States, the regulator couldn't stop it. We also had the 100th anniversary year, uh, anniversary of, of, of the party in China. And therefore, they, they, they were very hesitant to, to do something disruptive, like trying to stop Didi because of that celebration occurring in, in China. Uh, so I think I think the regulator is simply saying that, you know, going forward, you're going to have to receive some approval. We want to know who your technology providers are. I don't think this is the end in the long term of U.S. listing for Chinese companies. Shortly in the in the short term, there's no there's not going to be much of an appetite. But I think in the long run, a lot of global private equity money wants a U.S. listing uh, because of the size and scale of U.S. capital markets. A lot of that private equity money funding Chinese companies, they want a U.S. listing listing uh, in order as part of their exit strategy. In the long run, I don't think it changes. Certainly some pretty severe headwinds in the short term. 
And finally, Brenton, what does it meant? What have all this meant specifically for your fund? I mean, clearly you've taken a steep loss this week as a result of all these other Chinese companies getting weighed down by the headlines. Are you reassessing your asset allocations here? I mean, how are you sort of scrutinizing what's to come on the regulatory front, but weighing that with the growth opportunities that still exist? Yeah, it, it really is a balancing act, Akiko. Uh, we don't know the end game of regulation. We've not seen it impact the companies thus far. And we contrast that with China's urban middle class is spending 7.4 trillion annually. These companies within K-Web, uh, that flows through them. You know, retail sales online is 30% of all retail sales in China. That number is bigger than the size of retail sales in the United States. Uh, so the fundamentals have never been stronger. K-Web's peg is now below one. Um, it's very hard to find companies as growing as fast as these companies. But as much as investors have, based on the sum of all fears, pushing down the, the stock price of these companies, at the same time, you contrast that with the long run. Uh, maybe this is some element of irrational pessimism on their part. Uh, time will tell. Okay, we'll be watching that, Brendan. Uh, hope you have a good weekend. Brendan Ahern, Crane Shares <laughs> ETS Chief Investment Officer. So the world will watch Sunday when Sir Richard Branson is planning to launch himself and several other people aboard one of his Virgin Galactic uh, space planes into suborbit. I believe the actual suborbit portion of the flight is all of 20 seconds, uh, but it's still really cool, right? But our next guest is someone who can say, been there, done that, three space shuttle missions, spent several months aboard the International Space Station. But to help us understand what's going on in this new space race, we invite into the stream Leroy Chow. He's a former NASA astronaut and ISS commander. It's good to have you here, sir. And first, this is historic, the fact that space tourism is now here. What are you taking away from what's supposed to happen on Sunday? Well, this is a big deal because, you know, the promise of suborbital flight as was supposed to come a lot earlier. Um, and, you know, of course, we have uh, seen several people pay a lot more money to go into orbit for around a week or so. But this is a big deal because, uh, you know, Richard Branson and uh, in a few days later, Jeff Bezos plan to take their spacecraft right in their spacecraft and go up into suborbital flight. What that means is it'll touch space. These spacecraft will touch space. They won't go into Earth orbit, but they'll touch space for, you know, just a, just a few minutes and then come back down and return to the Earth. And so this is heralding a new era, commercial space of commercial space. So uh, very excited to see this happen. I got to ask you, I'm going to geek out here because you, you went past suborbit. You were aboard the International Space Station for several months. Right the three shuttle missions. What's it like, and is there a difference between when you're in orbit versus suborbit, the experience a passenger has? Oh, absolutely. If you're suborbital, I mean, you're only going to be in zero gravity for, you know, just maybe a few minutes, you know. So basically, you're on a parabolic arc. You're going to go fly up. You're going to come over and be weightless, see the curvature of the Earth, see the beauty of the Earth and, and look out into the universe. And then you're going to be coming back down into the atmosphere. Uh, the difference, of course, if you get into orbit, you're going to be going 17,500 miles an hour to orbit the Earth. Uh, on the other hand, these suborbital flights, they'll probably get up to around, uh, you know, Mach 3 or so, so somewhere around, you know, 2,000 miles an hour uh, instead of getting up to that 17,500 that you need to, to sustain orbit. Uh, once you're in orbit aboard the International Space Station, my longest mission was six and a half months, very different experience in just a few minutes. Um, you, you touched upon something that is a bit macabre that I've been dying to ask. Is there any chance, whether it's the Virgin Galactic space plane or the Blue Origin capsule, that they could go too far and, oops, we broke out, we're in orbit, now we can't get back? Well, they wouldn't get into orbit because you've got to get that orbital speed of 17,500 miles an hour. Space, those spacecraft are not designed to do that. They don't have the fuel to do it. So there's no way they could accidentally get into orbit. Uh, of course, there are plenty of other things that could go wrong, but both those spacecraft have been through uh, numerous test flights. And so, uh, you know, it, sh it shows a lot that the founders uh, these two individuals are actually going to go fly on these spacecraft that gives people, should give people a lot of confidence that the test program was very rigorous. I, I, I don't remember the year, but it was at least 10, maybe more uh, years ago. I had the privilege of covering the last shuttle launch because President Obama had 
put into place, I guess, time to privatize the space program. We hear about the Chinese, you know, making great strides. They, they've got a, something that landed on the moon. They've got something that's landed on Mars. Yet they're so 20th century. It's a government program where now we have a private sector. You look at SpaceX going to the ISS. Is this, you know, cat out of the bag? Here comes you and I one day might be able to buy a ticket to go into suborbit. And then I'm hoping one day into orbit. Sure, it's going to take a technological breakthrough to uh, really bring the price of a very reliable, robust propulsion system down because rocket engines are expensive and that's really kind of the driving force. These rockets, these spacecraft, uh, it takes a lot to get them to be very reliable, a lot of moving parts. And so that's why you see the price come down from, say, around $70 million for a one-week orbital flight with the Russians aboard the ISS down to about $250,000 for a few minute flight into space aboard um, Virgin Galactic or uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, Shep New Shepard spacecraft. Uh, but it's still out of reach for most people, right? And would you rather buy a house or would you rather go on this uh, several minute experience into space? Most people don't have that kind of disposable income. So we're not there yet, but we're going in the right direction. And what's the coolest thing? I mean, I, forgive me for, again, geeking up. What's the coolest thing for you? Because as I said in the introduction, been there, done that for you. You did it more than, you did it three to four times you were in orbit. Well, that's true. I've been in lower Earth orbit for a cumulative total of about almost 230 days. My longest flight was six and a half months as the commander of the International Space Station. So, uh, frankly, I'm not interested in a suborbital flight. You know, that's a few minutes uh, of something I've already spent, you know, almost a year uh, experiencing. So for me, the big big deal would be to get a chance to go to the moon or to go to Mars. But it's very exciting that the commercial side is starting to break out. We're going to get more people into space, uh, not, not the quote unquote normal people who can afford this kind of ticket price, even though it's much lower than an orbital flight. But, uh, but it's exciting to see the beginning. And we all have a quarter million dollars lying around to give the Russians to take us up. Hey, real quick, you think we're going to get to Mars in our lifetime? You know what? I think we will. And it's not necessarily, I hate to say, because of a NASA program. I like to say we've been 20 years from Mars since 1969. When we landed Apollo 11 on the moon, everybody was certain that within 20 years we'd be on Mars. And of course, we haven't even gotten back to the moon. But SpaceX... Elon Musk has publicly said many, many times he started SpaceX because he wants to colonize Mars. He himself wants to live on Mars. Uh, they're building the uh, prototypes of the Starship now, and they're testing them. Uh, and uh, you know what? Um, uh, they're going to get there. Got to tell you, the time it takes to get from Earth to Mars is probably about the same amount of time it takes to get down Second Avenue and then cross over one of the bridges into Brooklyn <laughs> or New York City. Great having you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, we want to talk about the business of insurance now and how it's being transformed by technology. And for that, we're going to bring in Mike Joukowsky, the Duck Creek Technologies CEO. So, Mike, I want to begin with your background. I know you've been transforming the uh, insurance industry for a long time, going back to your days at Allstate. Just kind of bring us up to speed with where we are uh, in your endeavors, please. Sure. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for having me. Um, Duck Creek's a very personal business of mine. I'm actually one of the original architects of creating some of the software that we bring to market today. And uh, it was within Accenture at the time. I did spend time over at Allstate Insurance. And then I played a big role in carving the business out from Accenture and IPOing the business uh, last August. And we just have a larger ambition to really uh, transform the insurance industry and bring more affordable coverage to all people and businesses in the industry. And that's really uh, the greater good that we serve as a business. Mike, let's get to the numbers that you just reported for your third quarter. Uh, subscription revenue up 56% year over year, total revenue up 26% year over year. When you're taking a look at that type of growth, I guess, what's the biggest driver of your company's business and the growth that you're seeing today? Uh, the biggest driver is just the demand that we're seeing in the insurance sector. It's a sector that still runs on a lot of legacy technology. In fact, we still see a lot of mainframe technology. And obviously, in the aftermath of COVID and going through the pandemic, insurance companies had to send their claims adjusters home, their underwriters home. And they're all looking to go through some sort of digital transformation and make it easier for consumers to conduct business with them. And that is resulting in great demand for our products, because that's exactly what we do, is provide a digital infrastructure for carriers to serve their customers, launch new products, bring them to market, and, 
and uh, really serve the greater good of insurance. Well, can you tell us about some of the efficiencies and the scale that you can achieve for some of your customers? I mean, you're talking about mainframes. I haven't heard that term in a while. Um, I'm assuming things have <laughs> migrated to the cloud, but so what kind of efficiency are, are you achieving for your customers? Well, it depends on, you know, we see all kinds of different business benefits that customers can see. And quite often insurance companies measure their value in terms of what we call a combined ratio. And that's a ratio between total premiums that come in and claims and expense uh, that uh, in essence is uh, uh, they pay out. And what we'll see is based on underwriting efficiencies, claims efficiencies, the carriers sometimes can save two to 3% off of that combined ratio and become more efficient. Another thing that we do see is in IT, the industry averages somewhere between three and a half and 4% of premium dollars spent on technology. And we have some cases that we're working with carriers and showing that that number can be around two and a half percent. So we can really drive profound levels of efficiency for IT processing for them. You also announced that Geico completed its rollout of their auto and motorcycle business on Duck Creek across all 50 states and certainly is a large client when you look at the scale of Geico. But I'm curious just what this could potentially mean about your strategy going forward just in terms of attracting other types of big clients. Well, we think that's a big deal. I mean, everyone knows Geico, you know, 15 minutes can save you 15% or more in insurance. But the other thing I like to highlight is that they just provide exceptional customer service. And we're very proud that we're, they're able to leverage our technology to really help them better respond to customer demands and innovate faster. Uh, so it's a great case study for us. And we just believe that this reference point of having the second largest personal auto insurer, uh, in essence, put the balance of that premium on Duck Creek, really shows what's possible. And we hope to do more deals with large tier one carriers to help them along their journey as well. Mike, one of the more profitable parts of the insurance business is the float or the interest uh, that the company can make on the uh, premiums that they collect, whatever money they're warehousing. I don't know if your firm gets into that, but uh, is there a way to make that part more efficient as well? And do you assist customers with this? Yeah, I mean, obviously there are a lot of investors and insurers who are actually watching capital from outside of insurance flow in because they can take advantage of that float. In terms of our core business, we work on the underlying underwriting and you know casualty insurance side of it, so the actual processing. And I think where we can drive efficiency is we help carriers lower their overall expense ratio, which frees up dollars for them to either lower rates or return that to customers, or in essence, return that money and invest it differently. So I think you know having a more efficient insurance operation certainly helps on the agenda uh, to help them with investments as well. Man, we want to congratulate you on landing not only Geico, it's uh, owned by Berkshire Hathaway, isn't it? Nice to have Warren Buffett on your side. Mike Joukowsky, thank you for joining Thanks. us. Duck Creek Technologies CEO. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. I guess just your overall, you, you follow this stuff so closely. So once you saw the news of the crackdown in China and of course what this means for future investments going forward within this space, what's your big takeaway from the developments that we're getting out this week? Well, Beijing has been signaling that they're getting serious on this for a long time. And you saw, everyone saw what happened with Alibaba and Ant Financial and Jack Ma, uh, but I think they still didn't take it seriously enough. They, this has been a very, uh, this has been a very easy world to, to operate in for a number of years. U.S. investors were willing to overlook significant China policy risks because companies were doing so well. And China and Chinese tech companies were able to, to raise so much money on U.S. exchanges that they were basically giving wink winks uh, to the regulators who were giving them advice. Uh, th th this is a paradigm shift. Things have changed. And now Beijing is making it very, very clear that whether it's uh, whether it's uh, adherence to U.S. compliance issues uh, over over Chinese law, whether it's uh, securing of data in the homeland versus versus abroad. China is going to have a very strong take on this and they're going to start using their leverage in order to pressure companies to do exactly what they want. Well, I want to continue this then. What's the end game? Uh, I could easily see a scenario in five or 10 years where we simply don't have Chinese ADRs traded in the US, but is that really what the Chinese authorities want? It seems like they've raised their, they've uh, tried to effort their own capital raising efforts so they don't have to necessarily come to the Western markets. Um, is that part of their strategy? I mean, what's the big picture uh, end goal here? 
Yeah, I don't think that's what they want necessarily, but it's this is a very tricky uh, policy question right now because you're you're looking at at, at an end game that there's no. There's no clear end game to where we're going. The Chinese want their compliance, their regulations, their laws to be to be the top of the chain. And the U.S. is saying, no, you know, you're listing in U.S. markets. You, you have to adhere to U.S. laws. Now, in the past, this was done by a lot of winks and nods at each other. You know, the U.S. would have leverage in order to supposedly give audits to Chinese companies, and they simply didn't do it. And the Chinese companies would, would, would pay lip service to U.S. regulations, and then they do their own thing. But with the political environment changing and with the, the the row over big data and where it's housed becoming so important that these are no longer things in which both sides are able to look the other way. So China's pushing from their side, the U.S. is pushing from their side, and uh, there is no obvious endpoint for this. It's going to be a political game, it's going to be a geopolitical game, and we don't know where it's going yet. Well, and when we hear Chinese companies talking about the opportunity outside of China, I guess should we always be skeptical of that then going forward? Uh, well, I mean, look, the, the Chinese companies want to come to the United States and they want to go to foreign markets because that's where they can raise the most money. Now, uh, companies like Alibaba and Baidu and, and Tencent, all the, all, all the largest companies can raise money anywhere they want. Smaller companies, it'll be harder for them to raise capital uh, in, in, mar in smaller markets. So there, there has been a desire for Chinese companies to, to come this direction. Uh, and I think what Beijing has been laying the groundwork for for the last you know six to 12 months is to, to firm up markets back at home, whether it's on the mainland or Hong Kong, to 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 give them more leverage to say, look, you come back home and raise money. It's not it's not perfect. It's not as good as it was before. But we're in a new age, and and there is going to be some decoupling going forward. And as long as that's that's happening, uh, you know, you got to roll with the punches. I want to shift directions a little bit. The People's Bank of China kind of surprised a lot of market participants this morning by cutting the reverse repo rate. They're going to free up a, a trillion yuan, I believe. And um, some people saw this coming a couple of days ago, but it seems like the bond vigilantes or maybe the money market vigilantes, uh, they kind of forced the uh, bank into making this decision. I'm just wondering what your reaction is. Yeah, it's big medicine, but it's the wrong medicine for the problem that they're trying to address. And China Beige Book looks at borrowing and credit in China very, very closely. And what you're not seeing right now is banks that are don't have enough funds to lend to lend these to lend capital out to, to small businesses or to more broadly. What you're seeing right now is banks being pickier, sure. Loan rejections have been going up, but you're seeing extraordinary loan demand. Uh, moderating over the course of the past six months or so. So firms that have that used to want to borrow, uh, they're not borrowing as much. Our pent up demand gauge is falling. Our loan application gauge is falling. Some of these to record lows. So the problem is not that there's not enough uh, capital being dispersed by banks. It's that there's not enough firms that want to borrow right now. So so releasing a trillion yuan into the economy through a through an RR cut is good is not going to solve the problem. It may be a nice peppy bullish move for, for the stock market, but it is not going to help the economy in a material way. Well, but I guess more broadly speaking, what does this tell us just about the slowdown that we that we could potentially be seeing over there? Of course, they were among the first to rebound from the COVID-19 pandemic, but in terms of how substantially maybe that recovery has slowed. What, what what's your view on that? Well, there's always been sort of a two-track recovery. Uh, on the top line, things have gotten much better and GDP's improved because the industrial economy got up and running very, very fast. It's been doing very, very well. I mean, our manufacturing sector data were very good the last several months and, and for second quarter in particular. Uh, property's still going well. Commodity's still going well. But what's not going well? Services is treading water. Retail is doing very poorly. So you're not seeing a sustainable consumption recovery at all. You haven't since you haven't seen that at all since the uh, the coronavirus recovery began. And as long as that's happening, it doesn't really matter what the GDP number says. What you're doing right now is looking at a growth uh, is artificial growth that's not the, the the heart of you know it's not sustainable growth that's going to push the the economy forward. So I think until they get the consumption fixed that uh, these growth numbers don't don't mean that much, even though they're worried about the optics around them slowing down. 
Yeah, I've been reading articles uh, since DD News broke and the crackdown began about the regulatory structure over in China. And I was shocked to learn, I read this in an FT article the other day, um, there's really not a lot of linkage between the actual laws and regulations. It seems ad hoc. You got mid-level people calling other mid-level people on the phone, not even using comment letters the way we do in the US. I guess it circles around to our original discussion, like, can there... Can there ever exist a bridge uh, between our two countries that kind of meet in the middle somehow? There can, but that means that U.S. and other foreign investors are going to have to take China policy risk more seriously. You're exactly right. There are certain things that the Chinese government apparatus does. They have laws, and those laws are always adhered to. But then they also have suggestions, and they have regulators calling people up in, in, in phone calls and saying, here's what we need you to do. Here's what the bosses want to see. And if those aren't adhered to, then the companies like Ant Financial and like Didi get into a huge amount of trouble. So there are various levels in which you you have to make you have to hear the Chinese laws, but you have to have to also have to make the party happy. And in the past, that wasn't seen as a big deal. Uh, but now it's a very big deal. And I think that any investor that's investing into China and isn't taking this stuff into consideration is going to is going to really get walloped.